what are the steps that you would take for a scene just like this? Single operator, you know, one shot towards camera. What are the steps that you would take that should happen? Well, then let's talk. Let, that's excellent. And let's talk about this. I was called up a couple weeks ago to Chicago, Illinois, to work on a sci new sci-fi series that just started off. Prop Master called me. I really like him. He's very professional. Uh, I, I work with people that I know are safe, and he is one of those people. Um, he called me up there. They had a particular scene that they wanted to film, and I said, sure. I went up to Chicago. We went outside of uh, Chicago into a city, and we filmed this scene. The scene required the actress to uh, run through the woods. Uh, she was going to stop at some point in time and fire at uh, a guy that she was chasing, right? Uh, that's the scene. That's where they, I get the script. It gets sent to me on an email or whatnot. I go over the script. I say, okay, this is, you know, we can do this. This is how we're going to do this. And I prepare myself. Now, in this particular circumstance, I did not have to acquire the firearms from a, pro a reputable prop house myself. Uh, it was already in place uh, when I got there. So, a professional prop master who's cross-trained as an armorer orders the weapon that he wants to use and the director wants to see. They'll get a choice like, hey, this is a sci-fi show, so here's the options of really, uh, you know, futuristic-looking firearms, right? Yeah. They'll pick that one out. The prop master will call the prop house uh, out in California is where uh, almost all of them are. Uh, there's one in New York that's very reputable. They will ship that firearm to the prop master and or the armorer. Now, they've checked it. They've maintained it prior to that. Once it gets shipped, it lands, and it's collected by the armorer or the prop master. Now, here's something a lot of people don't know. These are regulated by the alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. These weapons have a mm. chain of custody. So when they get there, you have to make sure that you're in custody. I mean, you're in possession of these, and it's your responsibility at that point in time. You then, I check the guns again. So that's another check. It came from a reputable props house. They were checking it. It gets shipped. It gets checked again immediately when it's removed from its boxing, which it's shipped in large, lockable, very heavy-duty metal boxes, and et cetera, et cetera. And, and they're shipped a certain way, too. After they get checked and we know that they're safe and clear of any you know, obstructions in the barrels and any rounds that could be damaging, and we're looking for blanks. I mean, the idea of a live round isn't even on the table because that's just so yeah, foreign exactly. to the whole idea, but we're still checking for blanks. We put these inside of a safe, a lockable container, uh, something that someone can't get in that's very secure. That's actually also regulated, uh, and they remain there until time for it to be put out and implemented on set. The morning before or the day before, they're prepped. The guns are looked at again. They're prepped for the day's work, so you're not going to be rushed. Uh, any blank rounds that are going to be needed are sequestered into a bag. Any dummy rounds you're needed going to be needed, sequestered into a bag, and the firearms are separate. You go there the next day, at the lock back up again. And I'm not being facetious here. This is exactly how it's done. I mean, it may seem like, yeah, oh, you're going yeah. through a lot. This is this is in educational, I think, to understand how many levels of safety and secure safety and protocol were broken here. Exactly. Uh, then you come back the next morning, you pull them out. Another check is performed at that point in time. Then they're loaded up onto your cart. Now, your cart may be a bag if it's a small day and it's only one firearm firing. Or it may be a rolling cart, or it may be a lockable cart if it's a lot of a lot of firearms out there. Any of whatever you may have available to you from the props department, or you brought remotely, you at that point in time constantly watch those firearms and are in possession of them from the time they roll off that truck to the time they're used and the time they go back in. If you have to step away for uh, uh, to the bathroom or any number of things, uh, you either have a responsible party from the props department that also is trained in this to watch those things and never let them get out of their sight. No one touches them until you get back. Uh, uh, or you lock them up if it's going to be an extended, you know, uh, tour away from the firearms. You lock them down. If it's going to be, you know, lunch, then they're taken off the set and put back in the safe. Now, that's getting it out to set, okay? I'm curious about how does it get into the hands of the talent? Because one of the things okay. that we've been hearing when people talk about this situation that happened on Rust is that it seemed like the this particular weapon sort of changed multiple hands. You know, you have the props master, you have the armorer, and then it eventually gets to the AD, and then event, it just seems like it's bouncing all over the place. Right, and for right. something that that for something that was in a safe, you know, the night before, and taken that assume, seriously, and we assume it was in a safe. Well, you know? yeah, it, yeah. exactly. But right. how does it then get into the hands of the talent? Okay, so it's on the set at this point in time, right? And you're there with it. You know what's going to be filmed. You know what to be expected, okay? Uh, 
let's skip past the rehearsal. In the rehearsal, you end up, hand out a prop weapon, something that's not real because there's no reason to do the that. The rubber or the plastic, yeah, the, like the, you mentioned exactly. before. Exactly. And let them run through yeah. the rehearsal because they're, you know, they're moving around. They're figuring things out. There's no reason to have a real gun out on set. You let them work out their their uh, their scene. Uh, you know, I try a soft-handed approach. I let them do everything they're going to do creatively. When they get finally through and it's landed on their decision, then I put my two cents in. Is it safe? It's not safe. Yeah. If it's not safe, we're going to adjust. And if it's safe, we can move forward. Um, at that point in time, you stand by until they're ready to film. And... Uh, it isn't let's hand it off and you walk around with it and you know just hang out until they're ready to film. If I if it's more than a few seconds or, or you know 10 20 seconds they go by, I take it back and we just start all over again. But when they speed yeah. sound and say we're about to start rolling, I walk out to the set and right before we go out there, it has to be a double verification process at this point, which means some of the person of authority on the set has to verify what I'm verifying. I'm saying this weapon has no obstruction in the barrel. It's not loaded right now. I'm about to load it with these dummy rounds. We're going to check those two. Or I'm about to load it with this these blank rounds. Sometimes it's the director, the stunt coordinator, the first AD, the DP, the key grip, and all the talent. Uh, sometimes all of them want to see it. Uh, it depends on your relationship with the crew, how long you've been working with them. Uh, sometimes only one for speed. Usually when you start off, everybody's wanting to look at it and check it. Then when they get used to you and feel that you're safe, then it's just the AD, the first AD. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. at the very least, two human beings, two people have to say, Yes, this is a safe weapon. I've cleared it. I see there's nothing in the barrel and nothing here, and uh, we can move forward. At that point in time, you stand by, they get ready to roll, you load it with the blanks, you hand it off to the actor, and you've already, hopefully, if it's done right, had a moment to talk to this actor and make sure that they understand safe handling procedures and not to point the weapon directly at anyone or anything they're not willing to harm. And then you sit there and you watch it like a hawk from the, for the rest of the time, making sure it's being done the way that it should be done. And that's the proper protocol. Now, how often do you actually get to do that? Not to say that you don't, but do you ever get pushback in this process? Is there ever this feeling like you don't have enough time to do what you need to do correctly? Um, I mean, production is always trying to find efficiencies everywhere. You know, if you can shave a half an hour off of something, there's potentially another shot you can bang out. So there's, there's always a, a, a play with time. Time is really valuable right. on set. And do you always or do you ever feel like the amount of time you need is not being given to you to do things like this the way you want to? So obviously, as and it's one of the reasons I'm glad you have me on the show, you understand filmmaking and everything is about time and down to the seconds. Um, you know, when they say inviting and there's like 30 seconds to their own set, I mean, it's down to the seconds. And a lot of people don't understand that outside of our community. And they're like, I yeah. don't get it. But yeah, it's all about time. So that's a two two uh, sided question and answer right there. The one side of it is you're always being rushed. And no matter how rushed I am, those safety procedures that I just said, they're going to happen. They're going to happen yeah. whether I'm being rushed or whether I'm not being rushed. And if you and it has happened before, they'll get angry or, you know, you know, be calling on the radio every five seconds. Where's the gun? Where's the gun? Where's the gun? That's OK. You can just continue to do so because I'm going to take the time to follow those face safety protocol. Where I'm always rushed and where I don't get the proper time to do is instruct and educate the talent, at least on the minimum safety requirements. I usually wind hmm. up having only uh, you know, a minute or two, if I'm lucky, before, before we actually do this thing, or maybe a couple minutes as they're going between hair and makeup and trailer. And, uh, you know, I've always pushed for and been an advocate of, and it's not too much to ask, that any talent that handles weapons on set, live weapons, should go through a minimum, minimum safety training class. We're talking four hours from a professional instructor teaching proper safe handling of a weapon and what they're dealing with. So some of the actors don't even understand that it's a real gun. They think that it's mm. like we just talked about, that it's a prop, and they handle it like a prop. No one's ever instructed them. No, no one's ever told them what to do. Um, today, in fact, something made me feel very good. I had an actor uh, text me this morning, um, one that I'd worked with on a long, long TV show. And uh, he texted me, and he said, man, uh, I saw you on a show. He said, so glad you were out there with us. And then he called me, and I talked to him, and he said, his name was Mario, and he said, um, 
he said, man, he said, I was listening to you talk about uh, the education of the actors and how you talked about the dummy rounds. And he goes, that's exactly what you said to me. You took the time to pull me aside. You showed me what the oh, dummy wow. rounds were. You showed me what's safe. And he said, thank you for keeping me, you know, keeping me safe on that set and all of us. And I said, man, you couldn't, that makes me feel so good, you know, and that's the way it should be, you know, but that's not all the way that the way it is. It surprises me so much to hear that something that's so important and so risky may not get the amount of time that it deserves by way of preparation on set because I, I've never worked with an armor. I've never done anything um, uh, with weapons on set, but I've worked with animals a lot and I've worked with kids a lot. And there is an extraordinary amount of time put into teaching crew and cast how to work with the animals or how to work with the kids on set. like. And just thinking about something that, I mean, working with an animal is not really dangerous, especially dogs and cats. Like, what, what's going to happen? They're trained animals. But still, so much time is spent preparing for that moment. And to think that that amount of time is not given to something like a weapon on set is just crazy to me. It's crazy. It's crazy, and I agree with it, but it is actually very accurate. And, uh, you know, I, it's, there's no other way to spin it. I mean, um, you, you think about this for just a moment. Uh, if, if the studios said, you know what, we're going to make sure that we take time. It's just mandatory. Anybody working on a movie where they're going to be handling these weapons, actually putting their hands on them, have to go through this four-hour safety class once a year. Once you do it, or biannually. Once you do it one time, you've got your certificate for it, and when you go to work on a show, then you've actually went through this process so they know, hey, at the least, the base, four basic rules of safety are going to be followed here. And those four yeah. basic safety rules have been in place in the real world space, which I came from for many, many years for a reason. And they mitigate an accident if it's going to occur. And imagine what I'm about to say. All of the multitude of safety violations that appears to have occurred in order to allow a round to get onto set. No question. You know, whether it rises to the level of gross negligence and criminal negligence, that's for the investigative body to decide. And they've got a lot of work ahead of them to, to do so. Having said that, if that weapon had been in the hands of Alec Baldwin and he had been following those four safety rules and pointing that gun off of somebody, never letting that muzzle cover anybody, even though he was handed off a live gun and told that it was not a live gun, and I have no doubt that he didn't believe that. There's no, I do not in any way think that he intentionally pointed that gun to harm somebody. But even yeah. at that, he would have known, oh, I, don't, I, don't, I'm not, I shouldn't point this gun at somebody. And he would have been pointing it off to the side when he pulled that trigger, and the bullet would have struck the wall or the floor or something else and not Helena Hutchins. And that's just proper education. It could be very well that uh, he never was educated in that. No one ever took the time to teach him. Uh, no one ever educated him on safety, and he truly believed it was a prop. Uh, he was like, hey, this is a prop. It's not a real gun. Can't do any major harm. 